In this screencast, we're going to look at some special polar graphs that uh, every pre-cal and calculus student should be familiar with. The first type is of the form r equals a constant a times the cosine of another constant times theta. So a cosine n theta. And notice that right now I have a equal 1 and n equal 1. Now I'm going to animate a, so it's going to cycle between 5 and negative 5. So if you watch it, you'll notice that as a gets smaller, the circle gets smaller. And when a is negative, it flips over, so it's going to the left. So a seems to determine the diameter of the circle. Now what does n do? n is the coefficient of theta inside the cosine. If I change n to equal 2, I get 4 petals. What happens if I change n to equal 3? I get 3 petals. Well, that's kind of weird. I'm going to animate it. We're going to hop in integer increments from 0 to 5. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to stop it at four. And if we count the petals, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's do one more. When it's at five, one, two, three, four, five. How about six? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So do you see the pattern here? When n is odd, n equals the number of petals. When n is even, the number of petals is 2n. Now what do you think would happen if I changed my cosine function to a sine function? Well, instead of having polar axis symmetry, we now have theta equals pi over 2 symmetry. All right, so that's how you go from a simple circle to a rose curve. Just remember that A determines how long each petal is, N determines the number of petals. Another important type of polar graph you need to be familiar with is a cardioid. Now here's a cardioid. We've got this little dimple in here and it just touches the origin. This is in the this equation is in the form of a plus b times cosine theta. So watch what happens when I animate a. It becomes more and more circular. Now it's going to go negative. Let's change A back to 1. And we're back to our cardioid. Now let's animate B. This forms what's called a lemason. You have a loop inside a loop. So let's look at the moment when the lemason first appears, like right about there. Notice that they're very similar in value, A and B, but B is slightly larger than A. And that's the key to making a lemason. If B is bigger than A, you're going to get a loop inside the loop. If B equals A, so let me make B2, and let me make A2, you get a cardioid. And depending on what their values are, that'll determine the relative size of the cardioid. If A 
is less than B. Well, that could give us a lemma sign, right? If A is more than B, we get a dimpled lemma sign. Okay? So now, once again, as soon as B equals A, cardioid, B is greater than A, lemma sign. The last type of polar graph you need to be familiar with is a lemniscate, gate, and uh, it's just a tilted figure eight, basically. And its equation is r squared equals a squared times sine two theta. To graph it, I had to solve for r, so I'm graphing the square root of a squared times sine two theta. But here's what happens. As a increases, so does the size of the petals on the lemniscate. gate. So that's pretty basic. That's about all that it does. So those are the main curves you need to know when we're talking about polar equations. Circles and rose petals, centroids and lemasons, and lemniscates.